Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be back in Trieste. So uh, I thought since, uh, in fact, uh, we realized that I'm actually the only lecturer, I think, who's speaking about uh, early universe, the very early universe, that uh, I thought it makes more sense to not just focus on alternatives, but also put it in the context of inflation and then some alternative. So let's just say, in general, my lectures will be entitled uh, The Very Early Universe. cosmology. And uh, by way of motivation, uh, I think as we try to decipher what happened uh, shortly after the Big Bang or perhaps before the Big Bang, really our unique uh, probe to figure out that question, uh, the unique probe that we have are cosmological perturbations, primordial cosmological perturbations. So really, this unique probe is encoded in temperature fluctuations of the microwave background, or if you want, curvature perturbation, the various moments thereof, the two-point function, the three-point function, et cetera. And, uh, well, the sort of uh, general theme of these lectures will be that, in fact, uh, early universe physics uh, is encoded in the symmetries of these correlation functions. Specifically, specifically, we will see that symmetries constrained these correlators, much like they do in particle physics. So can they constrain these correlators? And correspondingly, there are Ward identities we can write down associated with these symmetries. And this is what we'll derive. So uh, specifically, the outline that I have in mind for these lectures is as follows. So in the first lecture, we're going to focus on in some sense, the simplest uh, case, which is what I call multi-field or spectator field. By the way, can you read in the back? Is it big enough? Yeah. Multi-field inflation. And we will see in this case, this is the story of having uh, spectator fields around that fluctuate but are not affecting the background expansion very much. And in this case, the uh, symmetries that govern fluctuations are, uh, is the full SO4, 1 group of isometries of the Sitter space. Then in lecture two, we're going to consider uh, what seems to be an even simpler case, but in fact, from the point of view of perturbations, it's more subtle. And that's the case of single field inflation. And we will see that single field inflation can be thought of, uh, at least the scalar perturbations thereof, can be thought of as the symmetry breaking pattern of SO4, 1 being spontaneously broken to spatial translations and rotations. And finally, in the very last lecture, we'll discuss uh, an alternative mechanism, which in general terms can be called the conformal mechanism or conformal scenario. And this mechanism relies on the full conformal invariance on three plus one dimensional space time. So at the end of the day, this is, this, it describes the symmetry breaking pattern SO4 comma two being spontaneously broken to SO4 comma one. And part of the reason I find this uh, alternative appealing is that on the one hand, it's, uh, it relies on symmetries. So it's not just some action that we cook up out of the blue. It relies on conformal symmetry. And uh, there are many different, uh, there are various different realizations of this scenario. Uh, one of them, as we'll see, being Galilean Genesis of Alberto, Paolo, and friends. And there's also a fight of the fourth example that was proposed by Rubikov. Okay, so there are different ways of realizing this particular alternative, as we'll see. 
Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the outline. And by the way, if you ask me what is my, some people have asked me what's my favorite alternative. What's my favorite scenario? It's not even on this list, okay? So, but <laughs> it's probably so provocative, I shouldn't start by talking about it, otherwise you won't listen for the rest of it. Uh, but, indeed, uh, or you'll skip the rest, but okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually serious, but I'll wait till the end. I'll keep the suspense a little bit. Okay, so let us start with uh, multi-field or spectator field inflation. So for our purposes, inflation in these lectures is really a phase of approximate de Sitter expansion. And by multi-field, we simply mean a field, so we really mean a spectator field which is a field that is light, it's present during inflation, it fluctuates but does not affect the background much. So one example of this is something like the curvaton, where you have some massive scalar, call it sigma, some quadratic potential, whose mass during inflation is much less than Hubble. So this field has a mass much less than Hubble. And the field, it generically will be displaced from its minimum. It will be perched somewhere on its potential. And by virtue of the fact that the mass is much less than Hubble, Hubble friction sort of keeps it there, it doesn't move at all, but nevertheless, it fluctuates quantum mechanically, it acquires a scale invariant spectrum, and then later on in the evolution, it can decay and convert its spectrum onto the curvature perturbation, which we later observe, okay? So for such fields, the key point is that for such fields, to a good approximation, we can treat uh, the background as exact the sitter. We'll see that we cannot do that for single field inflation, but for this case, it is a good approximation to do so as exact the sitter space, okay? So for starters, let us uh, explore the properties of the sitter space. So four dimensional the sitter space, we can think of by definition, if you want, as a four-dimensional hyperboloid in five-dimensional Minkowski space. Okay, so here's my hyperboloid. And here's Minkowski, the embedding Minkowski. So I'll denote by capital X's the coordinates of this embedding space. X zero will be time, and then I have spatial coordinates. Let's call it X one and X two, okay? So this is Minkowski, five-dimensional Minkowski. So the line element, in, oh, and the radius, I should say, will denote the radius of this hyperboloid as H inverse. And of course, this H will be nothing but the Hubble radius or the Hubble constant of the De Sitter space at the end of the day. So we have as our embedding space five-dimensional Minkowski space. So five-dimensional line element is just eta EB, dxA, dxB, where A and B run from zero all the way to four. And this being a hyperboloid, the surface is described by the following equation. It's simply eta AB, x A, x B is equal to 1 over H squared.
Now we can choose coordinates on the hyperboloid in various different ways. Uh, we will choose coordinates, so the coordinates relevant for inflation Is this, are the spatially flat slices, I should say. Okay, so if you take your hyperboloid, you can slice it in different ways, yes. Ah, the only motivation from my point of view is that the symmetries are easier to describe because here you have the full SO4,1 group. So that's the logic I'm following. We'll see that uh, in this case, correlation functions are quite constrained by virtue of the fact that they have the full SO4,1 group. While when we get the single field, then if you want the fact that the inflaton is both driving the background and generating the fluctuations, its fluctuations are directly sensitive to the fact that you're not in exact the sitter space, that you have some finite epsilon, some slow parameter. And so as a result, uh, the fluctuations of the inflaton, they're actually described by a spontaneous breaking pattern of this kind. So it's just for simplicity. We lack scalar fields. Yeah, we have one. It depends. So we only know, we only have one at the TeV scale, but who knows at very high energy scales. Yeah, so in general, in string theory, string theory is infested with scalar fields, right? They, they have more than they need. So at high scale, why not? And the fact that you would have some that are light, well, in my opinion, if you have one that's light to drive single field inflation, why not have many? Okay. Anyways, if you don't like multi-field, this is just a, <laughs> this is just a uh, warm up, if you want. Okay. Now, uh, so as I said, you can slice this guy in many different ways. In particular, if you slice it with uh, space-like planes, you'll get the closed slicing of the sitter space, the one uh, where you have positive spatial curvature. If on, the other, if on the other hand, you slice it with time-like planes, then you will get the open slicing. So the one that corresponds to a spatially flat slicing is the one where you slice it with null planes. So let, let's uh, draw again. So here I will use x4 for concreteness. This will be x1, let's say, x0. So if you pick a, a null plane, so here's null surface intersecting this guy. You draw a bunch of these planes in this direction. You, they will intersect the hyperboloid into these kinds of surfaces. Sorry, going on the other side. And so on and so forth. Okay. Each of these slices obtained by intersection with a null plane corresponds to a surface of constant time in the inflationary universe. Does that make sense? Yes? So, in fact, we can write this uh, using equations. One way to do this is to write the uh, constraint equation for the hyperboloid in this way. So we're going to introduce a tau parameter Introduce a tau parameter which splits the constraints which split the, splits the constraints the constraints, sorry, into two in the following way. So that constraint that describes the hyperboloid, we can introduce a parameter to break it into two constraints as follows. So I'm going to write it as x naught squared minus x naught squared plus x4 squared will be equal to 1 over h squared, 1 minus little x squared over tau squared. And then the other constraint is just the sum of the spatial x's, x1 squared, x2 squared, plus x3 squared is equal to 1 over h squared little x squared over tau squared. So clearly, if you sum these two, you recover uh, the constraint that we had. And now we have this parameter tau, which is an arbitrary parameter. Where tau here, I'm going to take to run from minus infinity to 
to zero. So one way you can implement these two constraints is as follows. We can make the full. Exactly, you'll see that in a minute. So now I'm going to write it explicitly. That's exactly right. So the tau parameter is parameterizing which surface or which null plane is intersecting the hyperboloid. I will make this clear now. Thank you. So indeed, a nice coordinate system consistent with this parameterization is the following one. So let's write, uh, let's write the embedding coordinates as follows. So x naught, I'm going to write as 1 over 2 man minus tau, because remember tau is negative. 1 over 2 minus tau times 1 over h squared minus tau squared plus little x squared. Let's write capital Xi as 1 over h little xi over minus tau. And finally, x4 is equal to 1 over 2 minus tau, 1 over h squared plus tau squared minus little x squared. And you can convince yourself in the privacy of your room tonight that indeed this coordinate system obeys these two constraints. Okay, these sort of exercises you don't do in public, but you can do it alone tonight. Okay, very nice. Now, coming back to the question that was just asked, indeed you can show by construction, it's manifest from what I just wrote, in particular, that if I add x naught plus x4, and this will get right to the question I was asked. So if you take x naught plus x4, then clearly the tau squared x squared bits cancel, and I'm just left over with 1 over h squared tau. Okay, so this sum is 1 over h squared minus tau, and given that tau runs from minus infinity to 0, this quantity is positive, and describes indeed the fact that these, this coordinate system only covers the upper half, only half of the hyperboloid, you see, because this null coordinate, if you want, has to be positive. So this, this doesn't cover the entire uh, hyperboloid, only half of it. You can also check tonight that using this, coordin this coordinization of the hyperboloid, that the induced metric under hyperboloid, ds squared. So all I'm doing is I take ds squared, which was the embedding metric, and I evaluate this guy using these various coordinates. So x naught equals da da da, you know, xi da da da. I do that, plug it in, use a chain rule, and at the end of the day, this gives, I should, I should write this as ds4 squared, you get, at the end of the day, the familiar, the sitter metric, 1 over h squared tau squared minus d tau squared plus dx squared, written in terms of conformal time. So if you've seen this before in terms of exponential, that's just when you transform to proper time, this is written in conformal time. So in particular, the scale factor in this coordinatization is just 1 over h minus tau. Okay, question so far? Crystal clear? Okay, very nice. Now, I'm sure you've seen this before. The reason I take this review route is to get to the symmetries. So if you want this hyperboloid, in Minkowski space is exactly the analog of a sphere in 3D Euclidean space. So it's like a sphere, 
And as you know, the sphere gets induced on it the rotational symmetry of the ambient space, of Euclidean space. So similarly here, the uh, ambient Lorentz transformations, the Lorentz transformations of the 5D space will map points of the hyperboloid to other points on the hyperboloid. So they correspond in our coordinate system on the hyperboloid to an isometry of the metric. So the hyperboloid, in other words, the hyperboloid is preserved by 5D Lorentz transformation, five-dimensional Lorentz transformations with algebra SO4, comma 1, since we're in 4 plus 1 dimension. And the generators of this algebra We're going to denote as JAB, as usual, XA DDXB minus XB DDXA, just like the angular momentum generators in quantum mechanics. And these guys obey the uh, SO4, comma 1 algebra. So the two commutators, JAB, so the commutator JAB, JCD, is just equal to a combination of etas and j's, a, d, j, b, c. D. Minus. OK. It obeys this algebra. This is just, of course, a generalization to 40 of the usual angular momentum commutation relation in quantum mechanics, the SO3 commutation relations. That's a generalization to 4 plus 1. OK. Now, if we restrict ourselves, so now we ask, how do these act on the hyperboloid? We can just use the chain rule. So in these tau x coordinates, it's another nice exercise you can do tonight. In these tau x coordinates, you can derive fairly straightforwardly that these guys will induce particular symmetries on the hyperboloid. And they're given as follows. So let's write them down. So first of all, there's going to be j i j, where I take so i and j, of course, run from 1 to 3. So these are like spatial coordinates on my hyperboloid. You can show that these components simply reduce to xi ddxj minus xj ddxi. So they just generate good old spatial, spatial rotations. On a hyperboloid. I can take a linear combination of a rotation involving the fourth spatial dimension, an i, with a boost, j0i. And that you can show, again, just using chain rule, that this is 1 over h times partial partial xi, which therefore generates a spatial translation. By the way, as a trivial point, but it's worth emphasizing, it's not translation in the ambient space that does this, because translation of the ambient space doesn't preserve the hyperboloid. It's a rotation, it's a boost combined with a rotation that does it. And you can visualize it this way. So here's the hyperboloid, okay, remember, and let's take, uh, this is the x4, x0 coordinates, and here are my null slices. So to generate a translation from one point to another, Sorry, what, let's make it dramatic to this guy. What I'm doing is I'm doing first a boost, so along this guy, and then a rotation. So this is the xi direction. So a boost along xi x0 followed by a rotation 
from in the I4 direction. And that's equivalent to translating infinitesimally. Okay? Now, these are manifest symmetries of our 4D de Sitter metric, because clearly the spatial part is both rotationally and translationally invariant. But of course, there's more, so I can take the uh, boost along the fourth dimension, J04, and that corresponds, that will define as D, capital D, and it corresponds to the following transformation. It's tau, partial, partial tau, plus Xi, partial, partial Xi. And you recognize this as a dilation, space-time dilation, in which, so this is a space-time dilation in which tau gets rescaled by lambda tau and xi gets rescaled by lambda xi. That's clearly a symmetry also of our de Sitter metric simply because, yeah, you just see it explicitly. If you rescale tau and x similarly, it gets absorbed by the one over tau at front. So that, is the dilate, that dilation is an isometry. And finally, the one that's really non-trivial is this one. So it's when I take the other linear combination, so j4i plus j0i, and that guy will define as k sub i. There are three of these. And this, you can show, is given by the following expression. So it's h time 2xi tau d tau plus 2xi xj. Sorry, it should be bottom partial xj minus minus tau squared plus x squared partial partial xi. Okay. Now that is less trivial, and that's something you can do tonight in the privacy of your room to check that this transformation is indeed an isometry of this metric. So that's going to be a, that's an exercise for you. Check that ki is an isometry. The other ones are clearly isometries. Okay. So now I want to consider, so now we're going to move on to perturbations. So let's consider a massive uh, scalar field in the sitter for simplicity. Let's consider a massive scalar on this de Sitter background. So the action for my scalar, d4x minus g minus a half d phi squared minus a half m squared phi squared. So now when I specialize to this fixed metric, which is this de Sitter metric over there, you get the following. So you're going to get, uh, so you just get powers of the scale factor. So you get a to the fourth from this, one over a squared from the inverse metric here. And so this guy together gives me a, uh, so you get a squared, sorry, a to the fourth from here, one over a squared from there. So I'm left over with one over h squared tau squared. And then from this guy, I get one half phi prime squared minus a half grad phi squared. And now for the mass term, I get an extra power of a squared with this guy. So I have one half m squared h squared tau squared phi squared. Now, this theory, by construction, better be invariant uh, under our symmetries. So we have the following. So since phi is just a scalar, it must transform as a scalar under this coordinate transformation. So, the, so this S is invariant under the following field transformation. It must be invariant under the following. 
So if I change phi via dilation, so delta phi, so delta sub d is lambda, where lambda is a small parameter, tau d d tau plus xi d d xi on phi. This is a symmetry of the action. And similarly, if I transform phi by this other transformation, there are three of them, so I have three parameters, which is a vector bi, and here is the transformation, is just what we wrote down, so 2xi tau dd tau plus 2xi xj, and finally minus tau squared plus x squared, partial partial xi on phi. So by construction, these are symmetries of the action. And this will be relevant for us in a minute. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So if you want, uh, these transformations are nothing but global diffeomorphisms, right? They're just global transformations, as you said, isometries. This action is a scalar by construction, so it's invariant under any diff. In particular, it's going to be invariant under a killing symmetry. So the only thing I've used here is the fact that phi is a scalar under diffs, and so I can ascertain how it transforms. So all I'm using, if you want to get to this point, I'm just using the fact that phi in the new coordinate system, right, is just phi in the old coordinate system. And then I expand in small parameter away from that. So for small diffs, and then you get. So now, in other words, yeah, so thanks, you, thanks for your question. So in other words, in this language, I don't think of it. This is maybe the, whatever, the passive or active form. I always forget. But this is the form in which, if you want, coordinates are staying fixed. But instead, I'm thinking of just transforming my fields. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so now we can use, as well, this action to study the equation of motion. I want to emphasize, by the way, that although this looks classical, I'm going to think of this completely quantum mechanically, meaning I'm going to think of phi as a Heisenberg picture operator, in which case it obeys its classical equation of motion. So if you want, thinking of phi as a Heisenberg operator, I can just write down its classical equation of motion, but really thinking of it as a quantum operator. And then it obeys, if I just vary this with respect to phi, I get the following equation of motion. So phi double prime minus 2 over tau phi prime minus grad squared phi plus the mass term. equals zero. And we will be interested in the limit where the gradients are small. So namely, this is to be thought either as late times when modes are, have been stretched well outside the horizon. So namely, tau goes to zero. So you can see this guy is suppressed by derivatives, spatial derivatives compared to one over tau. So we're going to ignore the spatial gradients for simplicity just to see how the mode behaves as tau goes to zero at late times. So we take. In other words, we can either think of this as taking tau goes to zero, or equivalently, uh, since you see that this, I can just multiply the whole equation by tau squared, so it, clearly that the parameter of interest is k times tau, of course, so this is equivalently just k goes to zero. Ignoring those spatial gradients. And so now we can figure out the time dependence of this growing mode. And it's easy. Clearly, it's going to be a power law. So we can let tau, sorry, let phi goes as tau to a power delta. And again, it's straightforward. You just plug it in. You get a quadratic equation for delta. And the solution, you get two roots that delta is equal to uh, 3 halves, 1 plus minus, this is the famous answer. Uh, 1 minus 4 m squared over 9 h squared. So these roots are real if the mass 
is less than whatever, two-thirds H. Okay, that's a usual bound. Otherwise, you get oscillatory solutions. But for us, let's just focus on this case where M is less than, so 4M squared is less than 9H squared. That's what we'll focus on. So these roots are both real. Okay? So as a result, we get phi at late times growing at some power of tau. We want to pick out the growing mode. And the growing mode, since tau is negative and going towards zero, the growing mode is actually the power, it's actually the power of lambda, which is smallest. Okay? So it's for the negative sign. So in fact, the growing mode solution, actually maybe I go here so everybody can see. So the growing mode solution will simply be uh, delta minus. So I should say, sorry, this was to be called delta plus minus. The growing mode is delta minus. So it's tau, sorry, phi going as tau to the delta, where now delta, I'm simply referring it to delta minus. This is the growing mode solution. And what this tells us is that, in fact, in these uh, symmetry transformations for phi, so these, these symmetry transformations, I can replace at late times, I can simply replace this tau dd tau, this logarithmic derivative with respect to tau, by delta, you see? Because I know the mode behaves in this way, quantum mechanically. Okay, so in, in other words, in the symmetry transformations, I can replace tau dd tau with delta at late times, okay? And moreover, uh, if you look here, you see that there's a term here which is minus tau squared plus x squared. I can also neglect tau squared relative to x squared since tau is going to zero relative to the scale, spatial, ca spatial scale of interest. This is the same approximation we made here. And so similarly, I can drop this tau squared uh, x squared And so at the end of the day, these transformations at late times on the field boil down to the following. So I replace tau dd tau by delta plus, let me write it like this, x dot grad phi and delta k is bi 2 xi delta plus 2 xi x dot grad minus x squared partial partial xi on phi. So this is how symmetry transformations should act on our field at late times in the inflationary universe. And these you recognize, they're nothing but uh, spatial, ordinary spatial dilation and spatial, special conformal transformation on the three plane. So these transformations, they're recognized, so this is spatial dilation. And this is just the spatial SCT, so special conformal transformation on the plane. And so this is the well-known result So asymptotically, the symmetries of the Sitter space, so SO4, comma 1, the isometries of the Sitter space, all that we've used essentially is that it's equivalent as an algebra to the conformal group on R3. And this, of course, is an observation that's at the basis of the DS-CFT uh, correspondence. So it acts as conformal transformations at late times. Now, in cosmology, we are precisely interested in computing correlation functions at late times in the inflationary universe. So we're precisely interested in this limit where k tau goes to zero. So 
So this is particularly convenient. So we're precisely interested in this regime. where k tau goes to 0. OK. And so in fact, we can use the fact that we can, we can capitalize on this to realize that our correlation functions, our late time correlation functions, should be invariant. So we can use two facts. We can use the fact that, first of all, our correlation functions that involves various powers of phi, they must scale as tau to the particular power delta where delta, remember, is related to the mass of the field in question. And secondly, we can use the fact that the correlation functions, the x dependence, must be invariant under the full conformal group in three dimensions. And by the way, yeah, so let's, sorry. Yeah, let's just get started. So we can immediately. And by the way, this is, a, this is an observation that's very old. Uh, I think the first people who talked about this were uh, Antoniadis, Motola, and somebody else that escapes me uh, in the 90s. And then, of course, uh, Strominger with the DSCFT. But one nice paper in particular that discusses this is by Paolo. So if you look at the paper Creminelli, Here's the phone number, 1108.0874. He nicely describes the consequences of these symmetries. So let us indeed uh, start with a two-point function. So with the two-point function, uh, already you know that the fact that the space-time is translationally invariant and rotationally invariant in space. So the fact that you have 3D uh, spatial rotations and translations. So just that fact, of course, tells you that the two-point function, so we're only going to consider equal time correlation functions. So phi of x1 at tau, phi of x2 at tau. Already you know that this quantity is simply, just by these symmetries, must be, in general terms, it must be a function of the distance, x1 minus x2, and time, tau, OK? But of course, we have more than this. We have the full uh, conformal invariance plus the time dependence. So the, in fact, the dilation, spatial dilation, is enough to fix everything. So just the fact that it must be spatial. spatial so what you know is the following. So their correlation function, x1 tau, x2 tau, by conformal invariance, by dilation invariance, I'm sorry, it's enough. It must be a function of the distance to the 2 delta. And the rest you fix by knowledge of the time dependence of the fields. So this must go as tau to the 2 delta. And that's it. So just based on symmetry, the two-point function is fixed up to an overall constant, which of course is just a normalization of the terms. Yeah. Ah, it doesn't matter. This is completely fixed. As long as it's preserving the symmetries, right? As long as it's preserving the symmetries of the background, then it's fine, yes. Yeah, otherwise, it's completely independent. Yeah? Oh, good question. No, it does, so, so you, you, just, you just have to be careful in taking this limit. So, as, so let's just uh, put the minus here. So in the limit where uh, m goes to 0, you see delta goes to 0. And what you get at the end of the day, if you start expanding this, so you see, first of all, uh, the answer becomes scale invariant. And there's a correction in delta, which goes as a log, as a log of x1 minus x2, which is what you expect. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, but this is the assumption we make all the time when we do inflationary computations. Now, of course, you can also have people have considered departures from what we call the bunch daily state, the adiabatic vacuum. As long as these are not too violent departures from bunch Davies, these, these departures will be erased as tau goes to zero. In fact, most of the time when people start fiddling with these states, they find huge departures, which in fact lead to a breakdown of inflation. So you have to be quite careful about the kind of departures you're allowed. So if you want, that's just for this discussion, assume bunch Davies, just to fix ideas. The point I want to make is just that even with this assumption, uh, irrespective of the Lagrangian I wrote down, I could deduce the two-point function without calculating Henkel functions or anything. And it becomes powerful now when we look at three-point functions and higher-point functions. So for two-point function, it's kind of trivial. So let's indeed move to, uh, ah, so I want to stress, that, yeah, so at the level of two-point function, there are no further constraints. So if you want the special conformal transformation, acts trivially, okay? So everything is fixed by dilation. At the three-point level, on the other hand, I have the following. So let's consider again three fields at equal time. Now again, uh, by virtue of the fact that uh, I have three powers of the field, the answer will go as tau to the three delta. And now I want to first write down something that's dilation invariant. Well, there are many things I can write down now because I, I have three points, so I can construct two distances. Okay, so in particular, so I can write three distances. So delta, I'll write first the answer. So I can write this, x2 minus x3. But if it were just about dilation invariance, there are other things. I could multiply this by an arbitrary function of ratios of these distances. Right, so if it were just about dilation invariance, you could consider ratios like these, okay, et cetera, et cetera. So all the various ratios. So by dilation invariance, it's not enough, but in fact, uh, once you impose special conformal transformations, you show that this function must be a constant, so that in fact this is the unique answer. So even the three-point function is fixed completely by symmetries up to a normalization. All right. And so on and so forth. Of course, as you go on to higher and higher point functions, there are more freedom, but they're fixed by conformal invariance. At the four point level, you're forced to have these cross ratios, function of the cross ratios, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the last thing I wanna do is uh, to actually because this will be helpful for the next lecture, I want to describe these transformations in momentum space. So let's write down the momentum space version of these uh, symmetry transformations. Since we're gonna make use of this next time. So we have in, uh, in real space, as we've seen, let's just do dilation. And I'm going to let you uh, do the SCT as an exercise. So in dilation, we saw that delta D of phi in real space is just lambda delta plus x dot grad on phi. So let's see how that acts in momentum space, in Fourier space. So let's write phi. So I'm going to write phi in, mo in Fourier space. So let's do it directly here. Well, no, in fact, let's do it here. So I have that phi. So if I write it in Fourier space, so phi of x is d3k e to the i k dot x 
uh, phi of k, phi sub k of eta. And so now when I apply this operator, uh, this operator x dot grad, so if you want x dot grad on this object, the x dot grad will only act on the phase, since that's the only one that carries x dependence. So I'm going to have d3k, so phi sub k of eta comes out, and then I have here x dot grad on, on the phase. So it's a simple exercise to convince yourself that the grad, of course, brings down an ik. Meanwhile, x is equivalent to i ddk. So at the end of the day, or 1 over i ddk, this guy is the same as k ddk uh, on this. So this is the same as k dot partial partial k. And now I can integrate by parts the ddk. And you see that the ddk is going to act both on the phi, but also on the k. And when it does, it gives me a factor of 3, because it's a divergence of k. OK, so I get, at the end of the day, this is equivalent to minus, by integration by parts, minus d3k of uh, 3 plus k dot ddk on phi sub k, e to the i, little nan. OK, and so at the end of the day, in momentum space, the transformation amounts to the following. So therefore, in momentum space, delta d of phi of k, oh, sorry, I switched to eta. I meant it's tau. OK, sorry about that. Hopefully that's clear. I kept switching in my notes. This is tau for conformal time. And so the variation in momentum space is simply the following. It's lambda times delta minus 3 minus k dot ddk on the Fourier mode. Now, why minus 3? It's obvious, minus 3. Why? Because you just lower the dimension, right? So if you want, the rela if phi has a dimension delta, then its Fourier transform must have mass dimension delta minus 3 because of the, the dk. So this is just telling us that in Fourier space, this field has a mass dimension delta minus 3, as you'd expect, the weight of delta minus 3, and then the DDK, the K to DK scaling as usual. OK, so now we want to use this fact. What we're getting at, again, which will be useful for, for next time, is to now consider how a correlation function transforms under, under this dilation. So let's consider a general, a general correlation function. which is O of K1, K sub n. So a general op, uh, endpoint function. And the various Ks here, the, 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 they, they correspond to different fields in the correlation function. And each of these guys can have different weight, so different deltas. Okay? And we want to see how does this uh, uh, transform under dilation. So first of all, uh, since we, what we know is for sure this correlation function is going to be invariant under spatial translations. So by spatial translations, we know that this will be proportional to a momentum conserving delta function. So by spatial translation, we know that this object O must be proportional to a delta function conserving the sum of the momenta. Okay. And we don't really care about this delta function aside from the fact that it comes along for the ride. So we're going to define, to make our life easier, we're going to focus on what on the amplitude, the prefactor that multiplies this delta function. So I'm going to write it as follows. We're going to define, uh, so O, so this correlation function, k1 through kn, oops, is going to be, by definition, uh, a convenient 2 pi cubed, a momentum conserving delta function, delta, I'm going to call it capital P. Capital P will be the sum of the k's. 
And now the correlation function by definition O prime. Okay, this is kind of a trivial thing, okay? But it just means the correlation with the prime is a correlation function without the delta function, quite simply, okay? And we want to ask how does the primed correlation function transforms, and so P again, just to write it, so where P, capital P, is the sum of the Ks. Okay. Chalk, 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 chalk. So let's consider how this, this object transforms under dilations. So delta D of this guy. So, so delta D of O is delta D of this delta function P times O prime. Okay? And now we just have to be careful about how these different pieces transform. So by definition, this object, which is an object that depends on NKs, will just be summing over the variations of each field participating in the correlation function. And so it's simply going to be a sum from A equals 1 to N of, of this operator, of this particular field variations, but sum for each delta in each K. So this will be sum over A of delta A minus 3 minus K sub A dot DDK sub A. Okay, acting on the whole thing. So acting on the delta. Delta 3P times O prime. And the reason I do this is just, is just to focus on how this operator will act on the delta. Because at the end of the day, what my goal is, is to write this as delta times the variation of O prime. So we just want to fish out how delta uh, gets transformed, okay? So let's do it. So this is a linear operator, so I can just uh, do the chain rule. So I get two terms. So I get minus, and uh, let's see how I want to do it. Ah, yeah, so the, del the delta minus three, of course, doesn't care, right? It's just a number, so let's just focus mainly on this guy. So I have minus sum over A1 through N of Ka dot DDKA, Sorry, like this, acting on the delta times O prime. Okay, and then I have the same thing now, but acting on the O prime. So I have sum, so I have the delta function out front times sum times delta A minus 3 minus Ka. minus Ka dot DDKA acting on O prime. Okay, so this last term is of the form that we want. This last term is because uh, the delta function out front and then some crap multiplying it. And so we just have to massage this first term. And it's very easy because of the fact that delta only depends on the sum of the Ks. Okay, so first of all, okay, so since it depends only on the sum of the k's, each of these derivatives is equivalent to differentiating with respect to p. Okay, so this is just ddp. And now, the sum of these derivatives acting on this guy, right, is just going to be the sum over k, because ddp on delta p is just independent of n, of a, sorry. Okay, so this will just give me p. Does that make sense? Yes? Just sums up. So I have minus, as a result, minus P. And uh, no, 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 no. let me see where am I? Yes. So minus P dot DDP acting on the delta function. And this whole lot times O prime. And then plus the rest. So minus this stuff.
The delta alpha was just multiplying the whole lot, so I just shoved it into this term. No, 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 delta is not the Laplacian. No, 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 it's just the weight. It's just the mass dimension. Yes. So it's just each, if you want, think of these as a collection of massive fields, each with different mass. The delta for each of them is what we wrote down. So it's 3 halves. So delta sub A will be 3 halves, 1 minus square root 1 and 4, A squared over 9, H squared. It's just the, the weight, the mass, if you want, of each of the fields participating in the correlator. Yes, I know in Russia, because my postdoc writes Laplacian as triangle, and <laughs> we have endless fights about this, but okay. Now, here it just means uh, weight, okay? Now, uh, okay, so we're, we're basically done. So, of course, this correlation function, at the end of the day, we think of it as going back to real space. We integrate over momentum, so I can integrate by parts this DDP, and then I'll get two terms. The DDP can act on the P, or it can act on the... O prime, but notice that if it acts on the O prime, it will be what I'm going to be left with will be P times delta, which is zero. You see? So the only place where I can get something on zero if, if, if it's this DDP after integration by parts hits on the P, which will give me, of course, a factor of three. So this gives me plus three. Okay, all this work for just a three, but okay. So is life. O prime plus the rest. And the rest is this. So it's minus delta. Uh, yeah, let's do it. So, so it's just sum over A equals 1 to N. Let's see, how do I want to do it? That's right. Yeah, so let's write it as follows. So I can write it as follows. So I can write it as uh, this guy times delta A minus Ka dot ddKa. Because that's the term that depends on A, gets summed over. And then the factors of 3, they just summed over, so I get minus 3n from this. And all this multiplies O prime. OK, so after this long song and dance, the end result is the following. It's not very profound at the end of the day, but it's worth going through it. At the end of the day, now I can extract how O prime varies so at the end of the day, the variation of O prime, which I ascertain from this relation, so now I just drop the delta functions everywhere, and I ascertain that, the, that O prime transforms as follows. It simply transforms as sum from A equals 1 to N of delta A minus Ka dot ddKa minus 3 n minus 1. And this is multiplying O prime. OK? Now, just to philosophize on the result, it's very easy to see. So remember, since we're working in momentum space, every guy in here has a minus 3 because of the D3k. So since I have n fields, I get minus 3n. All right, that's the minus 3n. But then I have, I stripped off a delta function, which would have given me another minus 3, so plus 3. Okay, so at the end of the day, this guy must have this effective weight dimension. And I'm going to leave it to you as an exercise to show the following. As an exercise, you can repeat this for the SET. So repeat for delta ki. So namely, you can work out how the SCT acts on momentum space first on the field, like we did here. And then you work out how it applies to a general correlation function. And then on the primed version thereof, and the answer is the following. So it's delta k sub i on O prime. By the way, can you see, or is it too? Is it OK? You in the back? Yeah? No? OK, I'll write the answer there. So the answer is the following.
It's very nice. You sit on your balcony watching the sea, you compute. And you find the following. Delta Ki is O prime is I, sum from A equals 1 through N of 2 delta A minus 3 DDK sub I, DDK A I plus K A I to derivative DK A squared. So this is actually a Laplacian in momentum space. Minus 2 K A dot DK DK I and this whole thing acting on O prime. So please do this tonight. The copies are due on my desk tomorrow. Just kidding. I'm very tempted to talk about my alternative to inflation for Matthias, but I'm going to restrain myself for tonight. <laughs> okay. I mean, he talked about aliens. I mean, for Christ's sake. I'm allowed to talk about whatever I want after that. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Questions? <laughs>